Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Libya struggles to rein in militias a year after Gaddafi's fall. Qatari Emir breaks the siege on Gaza in historic visit. And U.S. presidential candidates spar over who can inflict the greatest suffering on Iranians. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. The proliferation of weapons is one of the main challenges facing the Libyan government, which is attempting to restore stability a full year after the downfall of Colonel Muammar al-Qaddafi's regime. This despite the government's initiatives aimed at collecting weapons and integrating the revolutionaries into society. However, the presence of armed militias outside the government's security apparatus is raising concerns about the militarization of the state amid the presence of tribalism and the failure to complete the national reconciliation process after the revolution. Even though a whole year has passed since the war ended and Libya's liberation was announced, the extensive proliferation of weapons and the presence of brigades outside the government's security apparatus still represents the first obstacle for Libyans on both the government and public levels. The spread of weapons among some members of the population disrupts security. Right now, the large quantity of weapons is negative, not positive, because the brigades are not like before. We seem safe, but we want them to join the army. The army provides excellent security. From a security standpoint, even families going on a trip or visiting someplace are scared. If one takes a bit longer than usual to go somewhere, there's also fear. There still isn't any stability. The announcement that some groups gave up their weapons and handed over their headquarters to the army was welcomed. One such group that did was Ansar al-Sharia, which is believed to have participated in the storming of the American consulate in Benghazi. This leads authorities to remain concerned that other groups are still operational amid repeated attacks and assassinations. I think that the Ansar al-Sharia group was wronged. This group was with me on the front lines. Those people fought and did something good, but Ansar al-Sharia and all the armed groups are now under suspicion. The revolutionaries formed brigades and became armed. I don't think their ideologies are like what's being said about them. Their only goal is to ensure Libya's complete stability, as well as stability in the eastern part of the country. That's why people join these armed groups. But at the same time, I can't deny the presence of al-Qaeda. They are here, but their presence is invisible. The Libyan government is also trying to collect weapons and integrate the revolutionaries within a clear legal framework, but reservations remain in other government bodies, such as the Warriors Affairs Commission, which is affiliated with the Prime Minister's office and deals with integrating the revolutionaries into society. Uh, I assure you that all of the revolutionaries in Libya are looking for the opportunity to have a dignified life. They are looking for a way to contribute to building the state. That was the aim of the Commission's project. We succeeded in some aspects, but the government hindered some of those projects by delaying their support. The government was also late in creating measures for revolutionaries to be integrated into government institutions. And although the militias are not registered political parties, they still play a major role in a country that toppled what was described as a dictatorship through an armed revolution whose pillars were those militias. This camp holds revolutionaries who participated in the war during the Libyan revolution, but these camps do not include many armed brigades or the thousands of revolutionaries who still have arms and are deployed in different parts of Libya. The Libyan government says that this deployment is the the main obstacle facing the stabilization of the security situation in the country. From inside the February 17th Brigade in the city of Benghazi, Amr Jamil, BBC. The Prime Minister of the deposed Palestinian government, Ismail Haniya, announced that the visit by the Emir of Qatar to the Gaza Strip is an official announcement that the political and economic blockade, which has been imposed on the Strip for years, has been broken. Under the slogan, a hand resists, a hand liberates, and a hand builds, Haniya noted that the reconstruction grant offered by Qatar to the Strip reached $400 million. He noted that it counts as a victory for the Palestinian people over the blockade. ومن خلال هذه الزيارة 
This visit is an official declaration that the political and economic blockade that's been imposed on the Gaza Strip has been broken. This blockade was imposed by the forces of oppression and tyranny, aiming to break our will, end our resistance, and suppress our stance. The visit to the Strip, which is being described as historic, is the second for the Emir of Qatar after his visit in 1999. Between the two visits, the situation in Gaza has witnessed big changes. When the Emir of Qatar came to Gaza over 13 years ago, in a visit described as historic, he was the first Gulf leader to come to Palestine since 1967, and the situation there was far from the current scenario. At the time, he was welcomed by the late Palestinian president, Yasser Arafat. He appeared comfortable with the messages that the visit brought, since the man was longing for Arab support in a confrontation with Israel, which took on different characteristics after the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993. At the time, Arafat was suffering from Israel's reluctance to implement the terms of the Y Plantation Agreement. The agreement was signed in October 1998 in order to bring the Oslo Accord out of the choking deadlock it had reached. Gaza now is different from the Gaza that the Emir of Qatar had visited the first time. The discussion within it about its peace and agreements has become part of the past. Since July 2007, the Strip has been suffering from a choking blockade, described as the longest in modern-day history. The blockade was permeated by a destructive war between the end of 2008 and the beginning of 2009. The visit by the Emir of Qatar to land that came out from under Israeli destruction was not the only one on his record. He was the first Arab official to visit Beirut's southern suburbs and the Lebanese south after the 2006 war. وكان أيضا من أبرز المساهمين في إعادة أعمار المدن والقرى اللبنانية. He was also one of the most prominent contributors in the rebuilding of southern Lebanon cities and villages, which are adjacent to the border with Israel, after they were exposed to a war described as the most destructive in its modern history. American forces have killed at least seven Afghans in separate incidents across the country on Sunday. Four children were among the victims. They died in American missile attacks in the eastern province of Logar. The U.S.-led military alliance has confirmed the children were killed in its operation. A correspondent in Kabul, Faiz Khorshid, tells us more. On Sunday, four more Afghan children who were on their way to school were killed by American forces when a heavy clashes erupted by the, between the American and the Taliban militants. The American forces are starting uh, firing missiles from their base against the Taliban militants, but it was those four Afghan children who lost their lives. Three Afghan people were also detained in uh, Zabul province in the south by American forces, and later on they were shot dead by the American forces. And these latest civilian deaths at the hands of American forces have greatly outraged not only local people, but also once again President Hamid Karzai, who today issued separate statements from his presidential palace, is strongly condemning civilian deaths by U.S. military operations. And this time, President Hamid Karzai has said that such civilian casualties would not be accepted and tolerated anymore by the Afghan people. Let me remind you that the number of civilian casualties since this war began about 11 years ago has uh, reached to over 20,000. It's a huge number, and most of those who have been killed in this war were uh, uh, innocent children and women. And this figure has been blamed both by the, on American and uh, Taliban militants in this war-torn country. Staying with Afghanistan, a rising number of foreign casualties. This time, an American soldier loses his life in the war-torn country. The U.S. military says the soldier was killed in a Taliban attack in the east. The exact location of the incident is not clear yet. Earlier in the day, a convoy of U.S. forces came under Taliban missile fire in the eastern province of Lagman. But it's not clear whether the American soldier was killed in that attack. Nearly 280 American forces have been killed. So far this year, the deaths have pushed to 300 and 60, the total number of foreign forces killed in 2012. With less than two weeks to go until Americans vote in the U.S. presidential election, the stakes are high as incumbent Barack Obama 
and his Republican challenger, Mitt Romney, run neck and neck in opinion polls. While the economy remains the major issue, the candidate's foreign policy outlook is likely to impact a number of undecided voters. Incumbent President Barack Obama and his Republican rival Mitt Romney have met for their third and final presidential debate, this time revolving around their foreign policy agenda. The two candidates touched on issues related to Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Israel, Syria and of course Iran. Most experts agree that the positions of both nominees are essentially the same, only the rhetoric differs. So in many ways, the debate was more about sophistry rather than real substantial arguments. On Syria, Romney criticized Obama's handling of the crisis. Uh, in Syria at, at this stage, I don't anticipate that in the future. As I indicated, our objectives are to replace Assad and to have in place a new government which is friendly to us, a responsible government if, if possible, and I want to make sure they get armed. We need to make sure as well that we coordinate this effort with our allies and particularly with, with, with Israel. But the Saudis and the Qatari and, and, and the Turks are all very concerned about this and we need to make sure they have the arms they need to carry out the, the very important role, which is getting rid of Assad. Can we get a quick response from the well, President? Because I want to ask I'll, about I'll, Egypt. I'll be, I'll be very quick. Uh, what you just heard Governor Romney said is uh, he doesn't have different ideas. On Israel, Romney's rhetoric appeared to be harsher. Romney has been a close friend of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu since the 1970s. It's an open secret that Netanyahu would very much like to see Romney at the White House as he thinks his chances of convincing Romney to attack Iran are much higher than with Obama. This while not a single word was passed during the entire debate about Israel's continuous killing of Palestinian civilians, of the expansion of illegal settlements and the persistent disregard of UN resolutions. Both Romney and Obama reiterated their unwavering and what some say blind support for Israel. Romney also said that Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad should be indicted under the UN Genocide Convention for questioning the Holocaust. Many experts have raised serious questions about the amount of money that's being channeled in the U.S. elections. Reports say that the cost of the third debate alone was more than $5 million. But these numbers dim when compared to the staggering $6 billion that candidates will have received this year to fund their campaigns. And most of this money comes from private corporations and organizations. Candidates are vetted. Uh, by uh, corporate interests and, unless, and the way it's done is that unless you have huge corporate financing and support you just can't run and the elections are basically bought. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you people are voting for uh, candidates that they don't like. Other candidates have been silenced by the establishment. They have had to turn to alternative media, very often located outside the U.S., in order to find a platform to present their views to the American public, whether it is Obama or Romney, who will be occupying the White House next January. It's going to be business as usual on foreign policy. to the political scene in the United States and now that the debating is over all that's left for voters is to decide for whom to cast their votes the presidential candidates faced off against one another for a final round in Boca Raton Florida heading into the verbal match in a dead heat just two weeks before election day public opinion polls reveal that 48 percent of undecided voters believe that US President Barack Obama won the third debate over his Republican rival Mitt Romney who registered just 40 percent Last night's sparring concentrated on foreign policy issues, highlighting both candidates' claims of support for Israel and opposition to a nuclear Iran. First of all, Israel is a true friend. It is our greatest ally in the region. And if Israel is attacked, America will stand with Israel. I've made that clear throughout my presidency. So you're, you're saying I, we've already made that declaration? 
I will stand with Israel if they are attacked. We will stand with Israel. And, and if Israel is attacked, we have their back. Not just diplomatically, not just culturally, but militarily. That's number one. Number two, with regards to, to Iran and the threat of Iran. There's no question but that a nuclear Iran, a nuclear capable Iran, is unacceptable to America. It presents a threat not only to our friends, but ultimately a threat to us to have Iran have nuclear material, nuclear weapons that could be used against us or to use to be threatening to us. It's also essential for us to understand what our mission is in Iran, and that is to dissuade Iran from having a nuclear weapon through peaceful and diplomatic means. As long as I'm president of the United States, Iran will not get a nuclear weapon. I made that clear when I came into office. We then organized the strongest coalition and the strongest sanctions against Iran in history, and it is crippling their economy. We're four years closer to a nuclear Iran. We're four years closer to a nuclear Iran. And, and we should not have wasted these four years to the extent they've, they've continued to be able to spin these centrifuges and get that much closer. Joining me now in the studio is special IBA political analyst Mitchell Barak to discuss the upcoming elections, both in the United States and here in Israel. Mitchell, good evening. Good evening. All right, the polls so far in the United States are indicating that Barack Obama won last night's debate. How important are these debates? How critical of a role do they play when it, in determining who the voters actually cast their ballots for? Well, first let's talk about the poll. The numbers that I've seen, about 48% said Obama won, about 40% right. said Romney won. As a pollster, I can tell you that is the most irrelevant piece <laughs> of information because it doesn't tell you who those people are. I want to know of Romney supporters who they thought won and of Obama supporters who they thought won the debate to see if there was any influence. So that's not really going to determine it. What I will say though is it's the last debate and it has to do with foreign policy. And foreign policy in this election and in general in most elections is very low down on the scale. I mean today Americans are mostly voting for economy and jobs. Yep. And it even came up last night, even though the scope was supposed to be limited to foreign policy. But because Israel seems to be important, at least between the candidates, and of course they were vying to prove who is more pro-Israel, what differences can you discern between the two candidates when it comes to this country? Well, you know, you have people on both the left and the right in Israel and in America that say that one candidate is better than As the other. As we've just seen. Right. So what that probably means is they're both okay when it comes to this issue because if both sides are saying that their candidate is better, then it probably means that there is something to that. The Syrian anti-aircraft missile fell on a health center in the border city of Rehani in Hatay province without any injuries reported. The battles are still continuing in several Syrian areas. After a visit that lasted nearly a week, Lakhdar Brahimi left Syria. He left a positive atmosphere behind him, according to an announcement by Syrian Foreign Minister Faisal al-Miqdad, who was bidding farewell to Brahimi. Al-Miqdad expressed his hope to reach a speedy solution regarding the ceasefire during Eid al-Adha and stressed the importance of reaching a solution on the ceasefire. Al-Miqdad saw that Brahimi's visit to Syria was very successful and that working with him is bountiful. And within the framework of the expected calm, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad issued a decree that gave a general pardon for crimes committed before the 23rd of this month. Meanwhile, Damascus accused France of obstructing efforts to stop the violence in Syria by supporting violence and terrorism. A statement by the Syrian Foreign Ministry called on the international community, especially the Security Council, to seriously work with the French body that is preventing a halt to the violence and terrorism in Syria. This comes at a time when the United Nations, through its envoy Brahimi, is laboriously seeking a peaceful solution to the crisis with a halt to the violence and terrorism. On the other hand, Iranian Deputy Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian announced that a national dialogue, which would include all parties involved in the Syrian crisis, may soon begin in Tehran or in another country in the region. He also noted that groups from the opposition refused to participate, adding that Tehran is still trying to persuade them.
On the ground, the decisive battle in Marat al-Numan continues between the regime's army and the Free Army, which is trying to control the city. And in Aleppo, Syrian planes waged air raids on a neighborhood that is being controlled by armed groups. As for the capital, Damascus, regime forces continued their raids on a number of neighborhoods and clashed with members of the Free Army. The issue of blocking Syrian satellite channels is raising questions. Once again, Syrian media is under attack. Journalists are being targeted and media institutions are being suspended from satellite broadcasting systems. The Syrian government announced that the administration of the European satellite Hotbird blocked Syrian TV and the drama channel, implementing previous sanctions imposed by the Arab League and the European Union on Syrian media. It forced those involved to invite their viewers to get the signal from the Russian satellite. This decision raised a series of questions in Syria revolving around the issues of freedom of the media, double standards, and how some express anger over the jamming of some channels, while others decide to cancel official media outlets without any credible reasons. As media professionals and researchers, we see many media channels in the world, some of which are also insulting and immoral, but they're available on satellite. At the same time, a voice is silenced, like the voices of the Syrian satellite channel and the drama channel. If we were to say the Syrian satellite channel is insulting, then why was the drama channel also blocked? What does that channel offer? What does the drama channel offer in general? The problem lies in the double standards that are used. There are clear, honest, and absolute double standards. The political principles of the West are now being adopted in the media. We are speaking out because we are proud of our media. Our media has been successful and has developed. It presents a real and rational image. But they just want one voice to be heard, the voice of demagoguery, the voice of the jungle. It's the jungle they represent. It is surprising that the drama satellite channel was blocked, a channel that only broadcasts art shows. Syrian journalists and Syrian TV personnel say that had it not been for the power and influence of the satellite channel, which broadcasts the truth, then serious efforts to block it would not have been exerted by Arab and Western satellite providers. The Youths Against Settlements group launched a voluntary campaign under the slogan, We Will Resist Here, to communicate with citizens, especially in the neighborhood of Tel Rumeda, in order to strengthen their resistance. In the framework of their campaign to strengthen the citizens' resistance, the Youth Against Settlements in Hebron launched a campaign called We Will Resist Here, which works to help families living in Tel Romeda. It supports them against settler attacks by carrying out volunteer work in their homes. The work we are doing today is near the Ramat Yishai settlement in Tel Rumaida. We go to homes that are really close to settlers and are subjected to almost daily attacks and to exclusive displacement by settlers in the occupation. We go to a house and we volunteer our day. We paint what we can around the house and we clean the gardens, fix the electricity, fix water pipes. We try to make them feel like they're not alone and that the Palestinian youths are standing by them. The voluntary campaign included rehabilitating homes by painting them, cleaning the yards outside, and fixing the electricity and water. We must show that we're neat and that the surroundings around our homes are organized, and we're sending a strong message to the settlers that we will resist in our homes despite their attacks and their cruelty in attacking our children and throwing stones and garbage at our homes. We'll continue to resist. It will be impossible for us to leave our homes until the last settler leaves. I'm very happy that there are young people coming here to help us and that they feel the suffering that we endure from living next to a settlement that constantly attacks us. We are very happy that they are helping, and we're happy with the efforts of these young people. 
Al-Aza's family home is subjected to continuous attacks by settlers in the Ramat Yishai settlement, which has been established on the citizens' land. The settlers did not like seeing the volunteers who were working on building a barricade that would protect the family from the settlers' stones and garbage. The settlers started calling them names and obscene words before they called on the occupation's army to prevent the youths from continuing their work. In several instances, about a dozen of them came to attack us. But what's more important to us is to continue doing what we're doing. You saw what the lady in the settlement did. She called on the soldier and complained so she would prevent us from doing our work. The work that we're doing is legal, but sometimes the army comes and tells us it's unlawful because the settlers would hurt us. But, God willing, we will continue our work so that it continues to lift the family's morale. This campaign, whose volunteers have relied on local donations, is considered a new kind of peaceful, popular resistance that aims to preserve the land and national identity in this neighborhood. Amid the occupations and settlers' continuous attacks on the citizens and their property here, the Youths Against Settlements group has insisted on forming a barrier to combat these attacks through peaceful resistance and their voluntary campaign titled, We Will Resist Here. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.